Hey there, everybody. This is Dinosaur George. This is episode 179. Man, I feel like I'm blowing through these 100 miles an hour. The reason for this, I had to shoot nine of these today because it was the only time I had time to set up all the lights and get the studio ready. And and it takes a lot of time to do that. So I'm going to try to shoot nine of these today. That's why I'm answering the questions kind of quickly. And uh, it's the only way I can get to so many of you that have waited so long to get your answers. So bear with me. All right, this is episode 179. And the highlighted item for this particular episode is a replica Tyrannosaurus Rex tooth with a section of the jaw. Now, the jaw section is the base, so it helps it stand up on your desk. So it's kind of like taking a saw and cutting off a piece of the section with the tooth jutting out. That's what this is. You see these little bumps on one side. That's where the lips or the muscles attach that, that, uh, that attach to the lips. Um, this is a big honking tooth. It's a big one. It sells for $15. It is item 3040. If you click on the link and go to my website uh, on the calendar, if you really like this item and you want it, just put in item 3040 in the search box and it'll take you right to the page. While you're there, I've got pieces that start very low and go up. So there's something affordable for everybody. This is kind of a big piece. All right, let's get into it. John from Lake District, England. Hey, Dinosaur George, it's John from Facebook. Johnny Boy, good to hear from you, man. And I'm glad to see that you're back, and I hope you're doing well. I am, John. I hope you are well. I hope your family is well. I hope everything is good over in England. My question is, how or when do you think Pterosaur slept? Woo! I like this. I theorize that perhaps small rampharynchoids may have hung upside down from branches or in caves like bats. However, pterodactyloids may have been too large for this. What is your opinion? P.S. Meeting you is absolutely on my bucket list, dude. You're awesome. Thank you, dude. I think you're awesome, too. And maybe one of these days I will come to England, and when I do and I go to their museum, you, my friend, will have to be my tour guide. I'm not paying you. Let's get that clear right now. But while you're there, maybe I'll pay for lunch. Maybe. Don't hold your breath, John. You'll starve. Trust me, you're going to starve. Okay, so how did pterosaur sleep? Wow. You know what I think they did? I think they did what a lot of shorebirds do today. Look for um, uh, reefs. Look for sandbars that have exposed land uh, out in the water because there it provides them with a sense of security. Nothing is going to sneak up on them because they'll make a splash walking through the water. They, they don't, they're not bothered by anything. I suspect they may have slept on the beaches like seagulls do today. I think you would have walked up, at least the little ones. Now, the larger ones, the question always is, yeah, but don't they need room to take off down the beach to pick up speed to lift off, much like an albatross? Probably so. So maybe for the really big ones, they probably would have had to choose a land mass that gave them lots of room for takeoff and for landing, because they may have come in, crash dived, <laughs> crash landed like, uh, like albatrosses do sometimes, or what do they call them, the blue-footed boobies do that sometimes. Okay, uh, Brandon from Morris, New York. Hello, Mr. Blasting. It's good to see you again. In your opinion, what kind of dinosaur do you think Indominus Rex could have been? Brandon, it's nice to see you. Nice to hear from you anyway. I can't see you. Actually, I can. I can see all of you. I can look through your screens right now. No, I can't. Um, but technology is going to get us there. It's going to get us there. Okay, um, you know, somebody asked me, why don't you do a Skype series with a bunch of people who get to call in and ask questions? That'd be fun, huh? Okay, what kind of dinosaur was it? Well, um, based on what it looked like, it was a little bit Tyrannosaurus, a little bit Spinosaurus, a whole lot of ugly. And so I think it was what they claimed it to be, just a mixture of raptor and T-Rex DNA and that sort of stuff, and they came up with it. Since it's not a real animal, it's hard to say, but uh, um, I would stick with whatever the movie said it was, Brendan. Okay, Sean from Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. Hey, DG, I have another question. Well, Sean, each question costs $10,000, so expect a bill in the mail. Do you think... <laughs> Do you think that uh, North and South America was joined and that terror birds came across? And do you think they went extinct due to competition from the saber-toothed cats, or the wolves, or other predatory mammals? Thanks again. You're amazing. I love your work. Thank you, Shawnee Boy. That's very kind of you. Um, so 
Yes, North and South America were absolutely connected at one point because we see that from the influx of animals from South America coming into North America and animals from North America going down to South America. Clearly that happened. Now, what was wrong with the, with the giant terror birds, I don't know if it was competition necessarily because they inhabited a variety of different places where there was a variety of different other competitors along with them. I think it was environmental. I think that they were able to adapt to the environment of the lower states because they were probably closest to the environment from South America. But I think over time, things like colder winters would have a greater impact on an animal that's not used to a cold winter. And so sometimes it can be a slow, gradual um, extinction because eggs are not developing babies are not being born, they're not making it, and as the adults finally run out of being old age or killed or whatever, there's nothing to replace them. So I think that may have had a bigger impact than the wolves and the giant bears and the saber-toothed cats. All right, Taz from Greece. Hi, DG. How you doing? Good, buddy. Did Spinosaurus walk on four legs or was it bipedal? If it was bipedal, were its hind legs big and long or were they short? Thanks and keep up the good work. Thank you, Taz. Um, from the new discovery, it looks like he appears to be better suited for being bipedal instead of quadrupedal. For some of you little guys, bipedal, uh, I, was, I said that backwards. He appeared to be quadrupedal instead of bipedal. Okay, now back to you little guys. Quadrupedal means they walk on four legs. Bipedal means they walk on two. Think of bicycles. There's two wheels on a bicycle. It takes two legs to go on a bicycle. So bicycle, bipedal. Um, Quadruped, quad runner, forerunner, quad is four. So that's where those words come from. Now, if in fact he is living a life in the water as has always been proposed, and if in fact the new design that they show him is cor correct, it would make sense that he is four footed. He's quadruped. He's, it, there's not an advantage of standing upright in the water because that puts your head so far away from the water. You want to be under there. And so you don't want exceptionally long back legs because they may not do you as much good as more evenly sized front and rear legs. But again, Taz, I just don't know. I, I've, I've not been able to see all of the information. And I don't know if the rest of the paleo community has had an opportunity to really voice their opinion based on this new design. I don't know how accurate it is. Aiden from Phoenix, Arizona. Hello, Dr. Blasing. I'm not a doctor, but it's okay, buddy. How was your day so far? It's going very good, buddy. I have wondered from some time now if it's true that T-Rex had a septic bite and lived in family groups. By the way, Allosaurus is my second favorite dinosaur. Aiden, love Allosaurus. I'm glad he is at least in your top 10 list. So did Tyrannosaurus have a septic bite? Well, what is a septic bite first? Septic bite means that it's got a mouthful of bacteria, harmful bacteria, and when it bites something, it infects the wounds. We see that with Komodo dragons today. Their mouth is filled with some toxic mess. And all they have to do is bite you and then follow you until you die of, uh, of the infection. So it has been proposed that Tyrannosaurus rex may have had that same feature in its mouth. And it would make sense to me because when you're attacking big prey, the best thing for your survival is to bite it and then get away from it. Don't stay and fight. You know, Tyrannosaurus is a very rare dinosaur. There weren't a lot of them. And so there had to be something that assisted it in being successful because too many of them get killed, it wipes out the species. So a septic bite, might, you know, biological warfare might have been the best advantage to allow him to get one bite in and to stand back and let that infection wear you down to the point where you cannot fight back and then he comes in and kills you. It's not possible to know with any certainty because unfortunately the bacteria that would have been on the tooth would have died millions of years ago. But that's a good question, Aiden. Nathan from Prestonburg, Kentucky. Hey DG, how's your day and I hope you're doing well. Thank you buddy, mine is going good, hope yours is too. I'm from Kentucky and I'm 12 years old and I love it here. You know, I've, I've only been to Kentucky twice. It is beautiful, I loved it. I'd like to be a paleontologist like you someday, but I also want to stay where I live. But the best places for paleontology anywhere in the US is, is in Texas. Uh, but uh, the best places for paleontology anywhere in the U.S. is Texas. Is there any way I can stay here and still make a decent amount of money? Yes, Preston, you I mean, yes, Nathan, you can. Now, 
you're going to have to go to a school that teaches paleontology. I'm not familiar if any school in Kentucky teaches it. But going to school to become a paleontologist doesn't mean you cannot go back to Kentucky and get a job. There are museums in Kentucky where they could use a paleontologist. Who knows what kind of jobs would exist where you live. So there's no reason for you to worry about that right now. You do want to find the best school you can find, and that's the most important part. Once you've done that, then you can go back and begin to look to see what is available in Kentucky. All right, Kevin, last one. Kevin from London, England. Hello there, DG. I have a question. Could T-Rex get bigger than the Sioux specimen? Absolutely yes. Of course it can. We don't know how big Tyrannosauruses can grow. We only know how big the biggest one is, the biggest one we found. It doesn't mean that is the biggest one that existed. Up until they found Sue, people thought the biggest a Tyrannosaurus could get would be the most recent one found. But when they found Sue, everybody said, whoa, they're bigger than we thought. Well, who's to say that's not going to happen again? So it is very, very, very likely that Sue is not the biggest T-Rex that ever existed. We have simply found one of the big ones. I think it's quite possible that they grew larger. Now, I don't want you to think that now we're going to talk about they become Godzilla size. There's a limitation to how big something can be and still be effective. And Sue certainly seems to be pushing the limits of that. And from my understanding of their estimates of her age, she seems to be getting older, which means she may not have lived a tremendous amount longer. So maybe age is the limiting factor that determines how big they get. But I do believe there are bigger Tyrannosaurus out there than Sue. All right, you guys, go to my website, check out the, ca uh, the catalog. I hope you find something you like. We ship worldwide and my shipping rates are very affordable. One thing I cannot stand is you go to some of these websites to buy something and they run something at a lower price than everybody, but then they add some gigantic shipping charge. So I think that's dishonest and I think it's disingenuous. I don't play that stuff. So my shipping charges, now shipping overseas, they're expensive, but they're not absurd. So anyway, while you're there, check out my catalog and uh, check out my other pages on my website and maybe one day I'll come visit you at your school or in your community, maybe my traveling museum will come and make a stop there. I'll see you guys in a bit. Take care.